कार्सन सिटी एंड द कॉमस्टॉक फॉर ला रेमी ला रेमी द वैगन पास थ्रू एट नाइट एंड द पैसेंजर्स फाउंड देमसेल्स इन ब्लैक हिल्स दैट वॉज द बिगिनिंग ऑफ रियल डेंजर फ्रॉम द इंडियंस शाम वॉज टोल्ड दैट एट ऑल कॉस्ट द पैसेंजर्स शुड कीप देयर विंडोज कर्टेन एंड एट नाइट ही एंड ओरियन सेटअप गन्स रेडी फॉर ट्रबल द नाइट बिफोर वन ऑफ द पोनी एक्सप्रेस राइडर्स हैड बीन शॉर्ट एंड वुंडेड बाय द बाय एन इंडियन All the men were uneasy and kept their guns at hand. At last, Sam Clemens fell asleep. He was troubled by dreams of hostile Indians and ambushes as he tossed and turned, avoiding the unabridged dictionary. There was danger not only from hostile Indians but also from desperadoes. lurking in the mountains the men in this region were fierce breed many of them in trouble with the law and hiding out at the little town little known stopping stations criminals who were wanted for murder thievery extortion often became station attendants and it was not unusual for the men who congregated there to drink play cards and get into bitter arguments there had been so much trouble at these stations outside fort larami that the company had finally hired a man to keep order his method do drastic produced results he stopped the fighting and kept the peace by hanging or shooting anyone who disobey his orders slade was the man's name and he was known as one of the most ruthless of a breed of ruthless men a man whom even the most dangerous outlaw respected slade was a division agent who would stop at nothing to have his own ways a high and efficient servant of the overland an outlaw among outlaws and yet their relentless les courage Slade was at once the most bloody, the most dangerous, and the most valuable citizen that inhabited the savage fastnesses of the mountains. Sam Clemens wrote of him. Slade had been born in Illinois of a good family. When he was in his middle twenties, he killed a man and had to leave the state. he had gone west and joined one of the wagon trains one day he and another of the wagon drivers had had a bitter argument the two men had drawn but the other man had been quicker slade said quickly that wasting life over to trivial or slight was silly and that it would be better for the two of them to fight it out with their fists the other driver cast down his pistol whereupon slade shot him dead all illinois sheriff was hunting slade and he would have to answer to the other men of the wagon train if they caught up with him so slade kept moving fighting indians and gaining a name for himself as a merciless fighter it was this reputation that finally brought him the job of overland division agent first at julesburg the post at julesburg when he got there had been the one most plagued by troubles stolen horses delayed coaches outlaw raids and missing supplies slade made short sheriff shrift 
of the problems he had to kill several men to get his coaches through on time but now there was not a coach on that line that was off schedule after slail clean up jesberg he was transferred to the rocky ridge division of the route this says sam clemens was the very paradise of outlaws and desperados there was absolutely no semblance of law there violence was the rule force was the only recognized authority the common the commonest misunderstandings were settled on the spot with the revolver or the knife slade was in his element he raided the outlaws recovered stolen stock and a number of purloined horses killed those desperados who would not fall in line and forced the rest out of the district he captured two men who had stolen overland property and hanged them himself as an example to others he was jury and judge a like a matchless marksman and a man seemingly incapable of fear it was said that slade had learned from the indians to cut off the ears of his victims and to keep them as mementos or to send them to those who would best learn by the gruesome warning all along the route some and the passengers heard one terrible tell after another about sled in due time excitement died away and the passengers became numb by the monotony of the landscape the unbridged dictionary kept things lively now and then but for the most part the trip was one of dull indifference on the part of the passengers punctuated by stops at the stations for cups of slum gullion and crusts of dried bread at one of the stage station was the group at sat down to breakfast among particularly savage looking group of men some wanting a disassociate himself from trouble even before it began seated himself on the other side of the room next to a quiet gentlemanly gentlemanly looking man who was sipping from a tin cup sam was congratulating himself on the cup of coffee that he had been fortunate to get when suddenly in the middle of his coffee sam heard someone address his companion as slade sam said as one paralyzed the coffee in his cup was gone but he made no move to get more then the supply of coffee ran low low there was only one cup full left and slade reached over to take that when his eyes fell on sam's empty cup slade tried to press the last of the coffee on sam and sam just as politely kept declining he was he said afraid and that slade had not killed anybody that morning and might be needing diversion slade insisted that he take the last cup and the sam finally did but he drank it without enjoyment for he could not feel sure he slade would not be sorry presently that he had given it away and proceed to kill me to distract his thoughts from his loss gradually the mud wagon went into the hills the scenery was breath taking now the heat gave way to coolness there were big trees and clear high skies the wagon passed a mormon immigrant 
train of 33 wagons at Horse Creek the passengers had an unheard of luxury a bath it was not a real bath of course but the driver stopped long enough for them to wash themselves in mountain streams there was a charge there was a change of mules 10 or 12 times each day and Sam was astounded to see that the entire process took only 4 minutes. Six fresh mules, all harnessed, were waiting at each station. The old ones were out and the new ones in in the, in the time it took to exchange greetings with the station master. The wagon continued on, leaving the Wind River and Uinita Mountains behind and passed through land of fabulous scenery. Though the view was often marred by long ranks of white skeletons of mules and often monuments of the huge emigrations of other days, and here and there were upended boards or small piles of stones which the driver said marked the resting place of more precious remains. Sam ate his first decent food since the beginning of the trip at the Green River Station. Hot biscuits, fresh antelope sticks and good hot coffee. Then the wagon went on stopping over in Salt Lake City where the where Sam was curious about the Mormons and spent some time visiting the famous sites and questioning many people about the belief of the sect and its leader Brigham Young. In Salt Lake City, Orion and Sam stocked up with enough bread, boiled ham, ham, and hard boiled eggs to last the rest of the six hundred miles that lay ahead and hereby freed themselves from the tyranny of slumgullion and stale bread. Sam and I, Orion, had been traveling for four, four days. It seemed to them that they would never be able to sit up straight again. Then suddenly in the distance they glimpsed their destination, Carson City, the capital of the territory of Nevada, named after the famous scout and hunter Christopher Kit Carson. It would be hard to imagine a place more disappointing. The town was nothing but rough wooden houses tacked together and stores without much to sell. A tiny congestion congestion of flimsy buildings in the midst of the great Nevada landscape. The capital of the territory was a sad looking spectacle where 2,000 people lived in catch as catch can houses. The main street had only four or five squares of one-story wooden stores fronted with board sidewalks that rattled when walked upon. The town boasted a plaza, a large, unfenced vacant lot with a library with a liberty pole in the middle, but which seldom saw anyone pro promenading on it. It was used for public auctions, for community meetings, and as a place to swap horses. Team Teamsters frequently kept it there. It was about as elegant as little alleyway back east, but Carson City was the hub of mining craze. Day and night miners galloped into town with the reports of the latest finds. There were ranchers from the surrounding territory and passing travelers were frequently riding in. All these men 
seem quick to lose their tempers and fast to use their guns. Scarcely a day passed without a gun, dual, dual of one sort or another. A hot, dry wind blew dust over everything. The whole town was covered with a patina of white. Fine dust from the Bazoi Washoi Zapari Washoi being the nickname of for Nevada. The governor's house was distinguished by the fact that it had two rooms. Governor Nei was to have a legislate composed of minors. The work was erratic. The pay only three dollars a day when room and board often ran four or four and half and a half, but many men were anxious to serve out of patriotism. Carson City had only been a capital since eighteen sixty one, six month months before. Orion's appointment. The territory was part of the land ceded to the United States after the Mexican War. At first, the territory had been a part of a Utah territory, but after silver was discovered, Nevada was made a separate territory. The recklessness and lawlessness of the miners who had gone out to the new territory was well known. Now, there was to be law and order. Lincoln had appointment Governor Ney to set it up. The legislative hall was something of shock, of a shock, a small rough room divided by a canvas partition, one side for the House of Representatives, the other for the Senate. The canvas partition, partition had been Orion's inspiration. Originally had stone building, which a private citizen had donated, had been one large room. Orion paid $3.40 for the canvas, but the U.S. government refused to honor his voucher, claiming that the sum was an extravagance. Orion ended up paying for the partition out of his own pocket. The legislative session was session was a 60-day meeting in which fighting took up as much time as lawmaking. Making some Sam quickly adopted a grab garb of the town, a slouch hat, blue woolen shirt, and pants jammed into his boots, and he felt himself a real Westerner. Presently, he heard of the incredible beauty of a lake nearby, the now famous Lake Tao, and curiosity finally made him take a camping trip out to see its splendors. He camped and fished and fell in love with the lake. On his return to Carson City, he was determined to buy a horse, even though he knew nothing about them. But all Westerners worth the name had horses. Very well, he would have a horse. He was sold a genuine Mexican plug and thought he was fortunate to get such a splendid animal for only $27. The horse had one thing that could be counted in his favor. It bucked whenever given the chance. The first time Sam mounted, he was quickly bounced out of the saddle. It was not long until the truth came out. Stranger said, an elderly man, you have been taken in. Everybody in this camp knows that horse. Any child, any engine 
could have told you that he would buck. He is worst devil to buck on the continent of America. And moreover, the old man continued, he is a Simon Pure, out and out, genuine Mexican plug, and an uncommon mean one at that too. Why you turnip? If you had laid low and kept dark, there's chances to buy an American horse for mighty little more than you paid for the bloody old foreign relic. Sam could not auction the plug off. He could not sell him. He could not even give the animal away. There seemed no way of getting rid of the genuine Mexican plug. At last, the man- he managed to pass the plug off on an Arkansas traveler who had passing through. Orion fell into his government job with gusto, but Sam, Orion's unpaid secretary, was restless. He wanted to go prospecting and make his fortune as everyone else was doing. Fortunes were being made right and left. Every day there were new stories of strikes of penniless Miners who were now worth a fortune, the town loafer had gone to sleep one night and had awakened the next morning to find himself worth a hundred thousand dollars. Esmeralda had come in and people said Humboldt was next.